hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you all know, uh, you're joining the AVPA and SANCOP Dialogues uh, webinar, Partnering to Crush the Curve. This week, we're going to be specifically looking at the economic impact of COVID-19 on the informal sector. Uh, as you all sort of join in, it would be great if you could just message in the chat box where you're joining from. Uh, it's always lovely to see uh, where, where our folks are, are coming from from the webinar. So just give a quick shout out in the chat box and tell us your, your name and what, what city and country you're coming from today. Um, I think we'll maybe give it another, uh, maybe Nancy, you wanna give it another minute or so for, for some more participants to join or, or do you wanna go ahead and get started? Yeah, sure. Let's um, let's give it a, a a few minute a minute. Yeah. Okay. Super. James, good to we see you. See. I think James has joined us uh, for every webinar every so week. far. Yeah, every week. <laughs> James, James is a is a a veteran <laughs> to our webinar series. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to be part and parcel of this. Thank Thanks you, so James. Much, James. Super. Janet, Janet has joined joined us. Great. Wonderful, a Nigerious OECD team from Paris. Welcome, Esme, that's great. Uh, Uganda, Nigeria again, quite a few folks in Kenya. Dr. Demi from London, welcome. Amit from India, fantastic. Oh, and hi, Emily from Zambia. This is fantastic, awesome. Uh, great representation, wonderful. Great representation. All right, super, Nancy, well, we're at about 40 people now and it's continuing to increase. For those of you who are just joining, um, say hi in the chat box and let us know where you're from, uh, city and country. Uh, it's just nice to see uh, where people are coming from. Uh, and I think we'll go ahead and get started. So Nancy, uh, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, hi, everybody. Wonderful to see so many participants. My name is Nancy Cairo. I'm the executive director for AVPA uh, East Africa region. And I wanna welcome you to this uh, third series of webinars that we've been organizing uh, around COVID-19 response, bringing people together um, and uh, discussing the, the various interventions that are going, going on across uh, the, the continent. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, AVPA, Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance, we're a Pan-African network. We have offices in Nigeria, Nairobi, and uh, South Africa. And um, we bring together uh, the whole, what we call the whole continuum of social investors. That basically means from philanthropists to impact investors, debt and equity providers, government, and even DFIs to uh, bring uh, capital to the table, and that capital doesn't have to be always in the form of um, financial capital. It could be intellectual or human capital. But to bring capital to the table, work in a collaborative and very strategic manner. Um, our mission is basically to increase the flow of capital that's going towards investing um, in solving Africa's uh, social issues. And we all know today one of the most pressing issues is COVID-19. Um, so we're really happy to have these webinars to bring people together to discuss what they're doing, what the gaps are, what they've learned, um, what you would do differently, uh, and how we can help each other. So uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, we have some really exciting speakers today, two from Nigeria and uh, one from South Africa. And I think I'll go straight into um, our first poll. Is that right, Ariel? Do we have an, a poll? Uh, yep, go for it. Sorry, you can push out the poll. Margaret, do you have the, do you have the poll? Great, there we go. So just, we wanted uh, everybody to get a chance to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how, how you're thinking uh, in terms of the impact uh, of this disease uh, on the informal economy. So you can see there, what parts of the informal formal economy do you think will be most affected by COVID-19 in Africa? So please fill out uh, the poll and um, let's see what everybody's thinking. 
Yeah, and maybe we'll leave it up for another 10 or 15 seconds. So please go ahead and submit your response. I, I don't think you have the poll up. This is the answer sheet. The poll uh -huh. results, not the poll itself. Oh yeah, <laughs> it said oh, results. Sorry, there we go. Let me try that again. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. There you go. So we didn't, we, we were showing the wrong. Um, Sorry, that was, that was my screen. fault. <laughs> so as, as people fill out the poll, I'll tell you a little bit about our speakers today. We have Gigi Al Alcock from South Africa, who has written a, a book called Casinomic Revolution, uh, which explores the revolution taking place in, um, in great uh, the marketplace places and in informal sectors across uh, South Africa. We have um, Betty Abba, who's a journalist and author and activist from um, Nigeria. And she'll be talking about uh, some of the work that she's doing with an NGO she started to uh, empower young women and how COVID-19 is affecting informal sectors where a lot of these young women live. Um, and uh, last but not least, Faye, who is a founder and managing director of um, Open Square Africa uh, and has uh, a lot of knowledge ar around uh, the informal sector again in Nigeria and has been helping uh, businesses in the informal sector position themselves and market themselves. So he knows a lot about how uh, this disease is affecting uh, his clients. So uh, can we see the poll results? Yep, you should be able to all see of them the, All of the above. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I was uh, expecting that, but in, interesting, 63% all of the above. Service sectors comes in second, and then informal goods, food and markets and kiosks. Wonderful, thank you for those uh, answers. So let me introduce our first speaker uh, or hand over to our first speaker, Gigi Alcock from South Africa. Welcome to the platform, Gigi. Uh, I'm handing over to you. Great, hi everyone. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk very quickly about uh, my subject matter. So uh, I, I coined the phrase gasinomics in Southern Africa because the term gasi is a term for the township. Um, or the informal sector. And basically, I believe this is the next great frontier of Africa. It is across Africa, um, undergoing a, a, a revolution. Um, and and uh, it's, it's, this, it's, it's unrecognized, because to a large extent, it's either invisible on the one hand, or on the other hand, it's massively fragmented. So because of this multitude of individual little businesses, we never realized the massive scale of it. Um, and I believe that this informal sector is undergoing a revolution. And more importantly, the COVID um, status that we're in at the moment has actually fast-tracked, not um, delayed this, uh, the importance of the sector. And um, it's going to continue to shape how the informal sector is growing, it's particularly how it's adapting to this disease. If we can go to the next slide. So, uh, and I think maybe just put up all of those points on this slide. So it's a hugely fragmented um, sector, but uh, because it's informal doesn't mean it's not sophisticated or um, particularly large. I just use examples in South Africa. In South Africa, for instance, we have what we call spaza shops, which is the bottom picture there, the lucky servant supermarket. The spaza red sector, um, and we, we have spaza and spaza rates, which are kind of small supermarkets. We have 100,000 outlets turning over about 200 billion rand a year. By comparison, the formal sector is turning over 350 billion rand a year. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of this. This sector is massively uh, disrupting the formal um, retail sector, the shop rights, pick and pay, and other large um, corporates. Uh, and, and in fact, it's the only sector that's growing. Then we have what I call Gassi fast food outlets, is about 50,000 outlets in South Africa, turning over about 90 billion rand in turnover a year. 
again, um, uh, uh, this is the sector in South Africa that's growing, seriously challenging the likes of KFC, McDonald's and others. Uh, residential and business rental in the in the informal sector is another huge sector. Um, just uh, renting out to spazas or residential, what we call backroom rentals, a 40 billion rand a year sector. Um, and then we have a whole ra a range of others, vegetable traders, schoolyard hawkers, about 500,000 traders, um, hair salons and barbers. So many of these are familiar to any um, marketplace in, in, in Africa, a slight difference in nuance, but the reality is that most of this informal sector operates almost identically, uh, particularly in any of the areas that I've worked across Africa. So there's a huge range of them. The important thing about it is that um, these are, are, are localized businesses, they're very personalized to the um, business sector, huge and, and sophisticated. Um, and I think the big mistake we often make, if you look at the, the lady on the um, right hand side of the screen who's selling what we call uh, Fed Cook or Amaguenia, uh, which is like the croissant of the streets, um, she sells 3,000 of those every single day for one rand each. And uh, so um, it's a lot of money in South Africa. She's making 30,000 rand, which is what, uh, 2,000 um, odd dollars a month uh, profit. Uh, from her, her little business, and yet we walk past it and we kind of see it as a survivalist and a subsistence business. She's been there for 11 years, trading on that space, making good money. The lady on the left-hand side is selling at a school. She sells in a schoolyard, and um, she makes 6,500 rand a month profit. She's been trading there for 26 years. Again, we look at her and we don't consider this as a business. And so we need to change the lens of, of what we recognize as a business um, and understand the dynamics of these uh, different sectors. If we can go to the next slide. So what are some of the responses of these various businesses? Um, the pictures on the left-hand side there, Sempagatini Bakery, um, is a bakery in Soweto, in a place for White City in Soweto, one of the roughest, poorest parts of Soweto. Uh, and um, they are um, continuing to operate. They were massively impacted by the initial lockdown in South Africa. Uh, and then what they did is they invested in these little trolleys that you can see there with the umbrella. And um, they placed um, uh, information on Facebook and via WhatsApp to all the people in the local suburbs saying that you can order your um, bread from us by sending us a WhatsApp pin of your location and how many loaves of bread you would like. And um, so now they um, are delivering hundreds and hundreds of loaves of bread to these pin locations. Some of these uh, guys are walking up to 15 kilometers a day delivering bread. The guy on the right hand side, a guy called Copano, who runs a little business called Gassi Convenience, um, which services the, um, the food outlet, so what's called a quarta, which is like the township uh, hamburger and other meals um, in the informal sector. Um, he, uh, he, he was immediately locked down because of the, um, the, the, the food outlets were, were, were restricted in South Africa. They're opening up on the um, on, on Friday on the 1st, and um, the, um, the first thing that they've done already with his 60-odd uh, customers that he delivers to, the restrictions in South Africa said that uh, all fast food outlets can open on condition that they only do delivery. No takeaways, no drive-through, has to be delivery. Of course, in the township, it's very rare to have any delivery. Uh, they have immediately set up a WhatsApp group similar to the bakery, uh, they're developing menus that they've placed on Facebook uh, and uh, people are, are able to, to um, start ordering. So the big thing about this sector is that the ability of the small businesses is that they are agile, they um, are able to bunker down and close their hatches and wait until the bad times um, go past. Um, they're able to pivot their businesses and adapt incredibly rapidly, something that larger corporate businesses are unable to do. We can go to the next one. So 
Basically, in my mind, as I said earlier, the time of lockdown and distancing will fast track a new way of doing business. In developed economies, it's about online and virtual. I think there's a uniform sense that business will never be the same again. Um, and that online and virtual businesses are going to continue to grow. The reality in Africa, this is going to be local and neighborhood, um, and it's going to be about WhatsApp and Facebook before online and internet. And, and the growth is going to be around how do these businesses adapt to local community, neighborhood business, and utilizing technology, basic technology like WhatsApp and Facebook to operate. Um, markets in Africa are invisible and highly fragmented, so the gig economy in many ways reflects the informal economy. If we look at the gig economy, Uber, Airbnb as an example, they're invisible and they're highly fragmented. The same happens in, in the African informal markets. So how do we supply to this? We have to consider an invisible and highly fragmented market. The second element is customers want lots of small amounts regularly, no huge trucks for cargo or anything like that. So how do we build route to market um, operations that, that work on that basis? And this really brings us to the need for databases, geolocation, payment, ordering systems. Um, and the informal economy is not technology, technologically driven. So how do we adapt to that? Go to the next. I think just put all three of these up. So these are some examples of um, businesses which are really a transforming thing. I wrote my book, Gasinomic Revolution, about uh, gasinomic revolutionaries. The one on the left-hand side is a South African business, Hello Pesa, that does money transfer. They've developed this app where you can order your food, um, your groceries using Q codes and uh, send those groceries to, uh, Ken to, to Zimbabwe and Malawi um, via this platform. And in essence, the, uh, the person who developed this saw, saw this happening in South Korea and thought, why wouldn't it happen in Zimbabwe and Malawi and South Africa? Quite extraordinary. The second one is uh, the uh, Tolerum Group uh, in uh, Nigeria with uh, Noodles, a massive distribution platform. Uh, data free in South Africa, the Moya Messenger. I think that the future is going to be very much about data free and, and the impact of that. Um, and um, I think last slide. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the township Hamburger in South Africa. It's called a quarter. We built for Parmalat a two and a half billion rand a year industry by driving. Uh, cheese slices into the sector with a, a fairly fragmented, uh, highly um, sophisticated distribution system. So the opportunities are there. It's about uh, these businesses, how they're going to adapt and, and how they're going to change. I think that's me. Uh, uh, I guess the, the last thing is that um, uh, if we click to the last business mirrors biology, Darwin said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who are going to survive, but the most adaptable to change. My belief is that the informal sector, to most extents, is adaptable to change. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gigi. Um, and for those of us who are joining us uh, as participants, please feel free to wel we welcome all of your questions for Gigi and for all of the speakers um, in the chat box. We'll have about 25 minutes uh, at the end of this for, for a discussion with, uh, with the speakers and, and possibly some opportunity for, for the audience to, to contribute their perspectives as well. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. We'll save them for the end. And Betty, uh, Betty will be our next speaker. Um, I think your slides are up, Betty. So I'm going to unmute you. And please go right at you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Betty, we can hear you now. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'll be talking um, about the economic impact of COVID-19 on informal sector in Nigeria. And I'm using Makuko community as a case study. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, and okay. you might just want to provide some context on Makoko for those who are not yes, familiar with Yes, 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 yes. So I'll, I'll go to that, okay. Um, 
So like uh, the previous uh, speaker has said, uh, the COVID-19 um, shutdown and um, associated disruptions have really taken a toll um, most on the informal sector. So I'll be talking um, mostly um, from my point of view, from my experience as a charity worker, as one who works with um, marginalized communities such as Makoko, so um, not as an economist. <laughs> so it's like a, an on, a hands on experience um, what's going on now uh, with marginalized communities, the informal sectors. So, next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? Can we have the next slide? Okay, so just a little bit of context on Makoko. Makoko is a community um, that we call City on Water. Makoko is situated in Lagos State, uh, Nigeria. Lagos is the biggest metropolitan uh, city in Nigeria. But somehow Makoko is a very conservative and um, um, an indigenous community right in the middle of Lagos with over 100,000 people. Makoko is uh, basically uh, a fishing community. So you have all kinds of um, artisans, petty traders in the community. And what makes Makoko stand out um, is the fact that first is the largest urban settlement in West Africa. Uh, it's also uh, unique in every respect. You have houses built on water, economic activities going on um, in the community. You see like um, mobile shops, mobile um, restaurants, so it's quite unique and it's become more like a tourist uh, marvel. But then Nakoko has had to grapple, grapple with poverty over the years because of um, the lack of opportunities for most of the residents. Uh, so next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Hello? Yeah, okay. Betty, there's, there's a oh. couple of second delay in the slides, so we're queuing yeah. them up. You oh, can just go ahead. Uh, and sorry, then okay. So uh, sorry just a little that. bit of um, the image from Makoko. To your extreme right, you have the, the, the floating school which made Makoko very popular a couple of years ago. Um, it's collapsed now, so it's no longer there. But that was what brought Makoko um, to the attention of the world. So this is what life is like in Makoko. So you can see the level of poverty, the uniqueness of the architecture, and the fact that it's a predominantly a fishing community. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so just like uh, Makoko, uh, the informal community in Nigeria is having it very hard at this point because they are normally not um, calculated in, or factored into government um, uh, stimuli plans or palliatives, significant palliatives uh, to really withhold, withstand economic shock, uh, shocks when you have things like this happening. And so, if you, like the previous speaker said, in the informal sector, you have the, the barbers. In Makoko, for instance, you have the fish smokers, the fish sellers, the fishermen, who sell their fishes to the women. So basically, life has been brought to a standstill in, in, in virtually every uh, segment, in all segments of the economy and, and virtually every corner of Nigeria. And so because these people depend on daily um, survivor, they will have to survive by making daily income. They depend on daily income. It's really impacted on their families, on their lives in general. Many have had to depend on palliatives, on non-governmental organization, from government, uh, which is not actually going around. So it, it's, it goes to show the fragility of the, uh, the, 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 the informal sector, how fragile it is, the lack of sustainability, the, the, the fact that the informal sector in places like Nigeria are not factored into government assistance. So when there's a little shock, when there's a little disruption, it's like everyone is back to square one. People just become beggars. And it's really, really, um, uh, Hard and, and to think that the informal sector contributes about 70% of the GDP uh, to the Nigerian, um, contributes about 70% to the Nigerian GDP. It's really unfortunate that that same sector is not being upheld, that same sector is not supported in a way that is sustainable and that it really grows. Okay, next point. 
Next slide. Okay, so these are some of the things I've already uh, spoken about the, the significance of the informal sector and the fact that it's largely neglected by governments. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, okay, so these are, um, these are uh, some of the things I've already mentioned. Like, for instance, in Marco Po, because to, to, to really show how um, poor a uh, community like Makoko is, the schools in Makoko that are basically built on water operate on a daily school fees paying basis. And it's so um, shocking to people when I talk about it, but that is the reality. Every single school on the water side, um, the, the schools are, there's hardly a lack, there's hardly any presence of government on uh, in the community. So the, this run is like a self-sustained. So the schools are private schools and then children go to school every single day with their school fees. When I got into Makoko about seven years ago, it was 20 Naira. Um, I don't know the conversion in, in dollar now. It's now uh, 50 Naira, which is really, really small. Children, so once children don't have that money, they cannot access education for that day. Uh, and I guess that is the only place in the whole world where children pay school fees on a daily basis. It's going to show how fragile the economies of the families are, that they cannot afford to pay school fees in lump sum. And so they have to pay instrumentally every single day. Okay, next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so my, my recommendation at this point would be that government should make conscious effort to engage the informal sector, to empower the informal sector, to make it um, to be part of, to enjoy the stimuli measures and perks enjoyed by the informal sector. Because after all, the informal sector controls the major aspects of the economy. And majority of the citizens are involved in the informal sector. I believe that the COVID-19 shutdown has taught us a lot of lessons that majority of the population have had to depend on government palliatives. It shows that there is really nothing to fall back to. There is really no sustainability in the informal sector and government could have made a lot of difference. Government could have prevented all this from happening. And then the need for government to really engage people in the informal housing who are basically small business people and who are in Lagos, for instance, who've had this false eviction thing happening over and over again. And people are completely destabilized. Their economies, their lives are destabilized all of the time by a government which is supposed to support them. And there seems to be no help from somewhere. And it seems to be an ongoing thing. You can't believe that just about two weeks ago, there was false demolition in Lagos State. A state that says everyone should stay at home. There's a virus that is ravaging the country and Lagos incidentally happens to have the highest number of um, people who are infected by, infected by COVID-19. And then you are throwing people into the streets. It just doesn't make any sense. So that goes to show the lack of regards uh, by the government of the day for people in the informal sector, in the informal housing. And this will actually change drastically when government uh, decides to pay a little more attention, just a little more attention. Uh, next slide. So, Betty, we're so running, running out of time. Now. If I'm running off, I'm running off. Next slide, minutes. you can make it faster too. Okay, just a little bit of our work in Makoko. I work with young people in the community. Uh, we engage them on a number of um, life improvement programs, scholarship, mentorship, uh, economic skill empowerment, and various other things. And we've found that there's a lot of um, potentials in these communities that are usually neglected and forgotten by the rest of society. And then these are some of the things we've done in terms of our COVID-19 intervention. Uh, we've done uh, several um, sensitization programs, jingles, uh, posters, other things targeted at the children. Be because the communities, a community like Makoko is densely populated. So uh, besides the economic downturn, besides the economic impact, if safety measures are not adhered to, and, and there's an infection in the community, it could be very, very, um, catastrophic because it's something that could blow up and then you have thousands of people infected. So we really need, uh, so we're targeting, because we work with young people, we're targeting most of uh, the um, uh, sensitization program uh, to young people. Then we also have uh, food relief measures. 
just recently, the Lagos State government, uh, the federal government selected our NGO as one of the 10 NGOs in Lagos to deliver food to poor households, which we believe will kick off this week. Hi, Betty. Um, Next slide. I Sorry think, to, I think Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you. We need to move on to the next uh, speaker. What yeah, I, I suggest think, is... I think we're basically true. Oh, wonderful. Okay, okay. okay. We we're true. true. All right. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, thank Betty. You, Betty. Uh, and we've had some good questions coming in, so we'll come back to those um, in a bit. Uh, for now, I would like to pose uh, the second poll to, to the audience. Um, so you should be able to see it come up on your screen. Uh, we'll give you maybe about 30 seconds to put in your response. What we want to know from all of you is what, what measures you think could best reduce the impact of COVID-19 on the informal economy. Um, so are tax incentives effective, reduction on energy costs, interest rates, uh, livable wages for the unemployed right now, um, any stimulus packages. Now keep in mind, we're thinking about the informal economy here. Um, so which of these do you actually think would support uh, the informal economy sectors? And maybe we'll give you another five seconds to submit your responses. Um, excellent. Thank you everyone for putting your responses in. Uh, I'll give you another two seconds before I end the poll. And you should be able to, to see the results here. So it looks like there's quite a number of, of folks who look like stimulus packages for companies, uh, employing informal workers uh, is, is the most popular, sort of followed by livable wages. So that really picks up from the conversation we were having last week around cash, cash uh, versus vouchers uh, to give people for you know, those living in, in informal economies. Um, and then uh, looks like health and safety conditions are, are in the top three as well. Um, so super. So we will now move into Faye. Uh, Margaret, if we can move to, uh, to Faye's responses. And um, Faye, over to you. Uh, and just do keep in mind there's about a two second delay when we're moving to the next slide. So okay. uh, just keep that in mind as, as we move ahead. Over to you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me well? Okay. Yes, 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 we loud can. And clear, Faye. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so just, just to just uh, share a couple of thoughts on uh, my views on uh, the economic impact of, of this ongoing pandemic in the informal sector. To give context, I run a consulting firm uh, called Open Squares, where we focus specifically on helping countries that are, sorry, firms that are interested in, in the nuances of the African market. And we've published our approach in a book called The Villager, How Africans Consume, um, consume Brands. Uh, if you could go to uh, the next slide, okay, the next two slides, where the talking points start from, yes. So I think, uh, I mean, the, just to give context to what we are doing as a business and where, what I think other businesses could also, what they could do, uh, some of these augment what the two other speakers have, have said. Uh, staying at home is very critical. We know that the curve is not is not yet flattened in, in African countries, likely because uh, we're just now getting the capability to test, to to test and all of that. Uh, in our case, our work is very cons is consulting and is IP based, so we basically can continue to add value to our clients uh, uh, remotely and uh, and all of that, which is true for quite a number of service uh, companies. Uh, I think the second thing that's very key is also to keep staff engaged. The reason this is key, really, is that this one of the roles of uh, of business leaders now really is to administer hope uh, uh, to the communities that they work in, uh, the people that work with them, the people in their immediate community, and that the keeping continual communication uh, ongoing is very key to that, especially as new issues arise. Uh, on a weekly or on a daily basis, new t test results are posted by uh, NCDC in Nigeria. The government speaks every every couple of weeks. It's important to keep uh, keep people engaged and keep talking to them as much as possible. Uh, we 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 endeavour to protect staff income. The reason this is key is because no matter the instructions uh, and the recommendations of the health professionals. Evidence has shown that people tend to break healthcare protocols when their livelihood is threatened. 
uh, as long as they're not able to put food on the table, uh, they will go out and do something. We've had, uh, we, had a, we have an interesting situation now in Lagos where I live, uh, where we there's a bunch of almost like a cabal of arm, rob, arm robbers who call themselves uh, the One Million Boys. And basically, these guys just sent letters ahead uh, to, to estates where middle income and upper class people read, uh, live and tell them to, they're coming to rob them and they come to rob them and they're robbing simply for survival. They just need money to live. Uh, um, next slide, please. Yeah, and so a uh, couple of learnings, couple of learnings for us. Uh, and I'm so glad Gigi talked about uh, talked about the issues of uh, you know using informal sector and all of uh, WhatsApp and all of that in the informal sector. It's important to to tech enable uh, your business as soon as possible. There's no business that cannot be tech enabled, and tech for us also includes things like WhatsApp, like Gigi said. Uh, it, it amplifies the ability of a business to deliver during this time uh, to their customers wherever they are. It's also important to stay as close as possible to customers to continue to gather real-time data uh, on their behavior. To be. This is very valuable to businesses. It's something that businesses are looking at and say, what is happening right now? How do we adapt our offerings and so on and so forth? Um, next, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, a lot has been said about the help that needs to be done, and all, all of those are valid. So I'd just like to add uh, these two to, to, to those. Uh, it's important that targeted funding is made available uh, to support innovations within business models uh, down, 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 down the, for SMEs, the informal sector, where they can, that can help them to deliver uh, to their customers in newer and cost-effective ways. Then we've got to begin to think about work workspace solutions. A lot of uh, SMEs and people in the informal sector work in shared offices and shared workspaces. Uh, the question now is in a post-COVID world, where there are key health protocols that we need to follow. Uh, how do we how do we rethink what our workspace solutions will need? Because Africa is still a very physical interaction-based uh, business environment. So how, how do we how do we account for that? How do we put uh, all of that um, all of that in place? So these are just two thoughts that I uh, thought I could add in addition to uh, what the couple of uh, the other speakers have said about the things that need to be done uh, um, uh, by the government and be done by businesses to support everyone uh, at this time. So um, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Faye, and thank you, Betty and Gigi, for all of your. Um, all of your insights. I think we've had a lot of really good questions coming in through the chat box. Um, so Faye, maybe I'll start with you. Um, James has, has asked this, and I think it's a really interesting question is, you know, I think both uh, you and, and Gigi alluded to the ability for people to sort of go online and, and, and sort of sell their services or provide their goods. Um, how do we actually support tech enabling the informal sector? Um, or do you see that the informal sector is, I know Gigi, you mentioned people are already posting their menus and things on Facebook um, but how do we actually support these informal economies to move online um, so we'll start with you Faye any thoughts on that yeah I, I think uh, the, the most important thing is uh, we have a benefit already on the continent which is that almost a huge population use feature phones right uh, and we can there, there are a lot of applications that work off the feature phones that uh, they are not feature heavy. Uh, WhatsApp is a good example. But if there's a way we could, if we could develop just means of educating uh, business owners in the informal sector to do something as basic as putting together a menu and sharing that through their customers' network, for instance, uh, uh, that's a starting point. Some of them don't have the level of education to or, or exposure to even do that, but that's one area we can support because. And then we have to think about the issue of logistics. You know, how do we actually uh, get those products delivered? You know, uh, uh, and that's where things like that very unique to Africa, like the uh, the motorcycles and the tricycles, uh, Okada in Lagos, Boda Boda in East Africa, and so on and so forth, can come in useful uh, to enable those business. So they, we have to find a very clever combination of logistics. Uh, and, and very low-end technology that, that will enable goods and services to be shared. The, the payment solutions are already there. 
uh, that's that that's not going to be where the where the challenge will be. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Faye. Um, I'm going to go back to, to Gigi now. There was a couple of, there was actually several questions that were really looking at access to financing. Um, I think Mercy, uh, good to see you, Mercy, asked this uh, a little bit earlier. Um, what, what impact is this really having on access to financing? Um, and I, I mean, someone had actually posed a question to us before we launched the webinar, was that some of the, the government incentives that are providing you know, tax cuts and interest cut rates are not necessarily reaching the microfinance institutions and the SACOs. Um, so really when we're looking at the access for informal lending and access to financing, do you have any sort of thoughts on, on how this is impacting that directly? Cool. Can I just add to Faye's comment first and then I'll come to the financing. I think just yeah, very quickly, do. Please do. the... Um, I think the reality is that technology has to be the way forward, but the issue is generally cost of data and access to data. And so uh, we have a high level of feature phones throughout Africa and uh, um, an adoption of things like WhatsApp and so on. Uh, I think the big opportunity is around platforms like the one I showed, which is uh, hash data free, um, which in essence, um, it gives you access to something called Moya Messenger as an example, which is a WhatsApp lookalike, but uh, all text messaging is for free. And the reason I say this is that we, re we really need in this space platforms, platforms like Shopify that are based on a data-free platform, where in essence people can go and build their ability to take orders, to do online shopping or whatever it might be. And, and the shift has to be away from online to, to um, app-based and low data or data-free app-based opportunities that Halapesa, Malaysia um, were case study is, is, is a case in point. Going to the finance, I think to a large extent, and I'll talk to, to South Africa as a, as a thing. So the, the, the micro-lending industry has been locked down uh, at this stage, probably at a time when probably people most need to be able to access uh, loans. I think for me, the biggest issue is going is about most of the informal traders are going to go through their, they're going to eat their their products, and uh, the hardest part is going to be about how do they reignite their businesses. Um, I've been working on a platform with the business community in South Africa, looking at a rotating credit type facility, because the biggest issue is going to be how do they restock their small businesses? How do they get going again? Uh, and I think that the big opportunity is around how do governments provide credit guarantees to either um, suppliers or to banks to enable uh, this, uh, this, this credit. The, prop, the biggest problem is that the credit that these informal businesses are going to look for in, in RAND terms is going to be not 100 or 200,000 or 300 or whatever it might be. It's going to be 5,000 RAND, 10,000 RAND, um, 25,000 RAND as an example. And very few entities are structured to loan money on this small basis. And, and that goes back to what I said about this fragmented nature of this business. It's about how do you supply a multitude of small amounts of money to um, uh, to, to informal traders, uh, you know, and, 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 and on a large scale, but as rather than a large loan on a small scale, a, a, a large number of loans, um, of small loans. So uh, it, 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 it's a problem, I guess, more than saying that there's any solutions. We are working on some options in South Africa. Uh, and I do think that to a large extent, the uh, credit industry. Uh, there's people like Premier Credit in Kenya, as an example, who lend small amounts of money to small uh, businesses. Those uh, uh, um, private sector credit um, entities probably need to come to the party in terms of offering loans at better rates and, and so on. So, so it, it really, for me, it would be how do we get the private sector to, to get involved on this level? Great, thanks for that, GG. And, and Betty, I'll come to you next uh, if you want to unmute your microphone. Uh, sort of connected to the finance, 
topic. There was a question from TK um, that's asking specifically on the daily school fees issue. Um, TK asks, is the Nigerian government or any NGOs doing anything to support families in Makoko to pay fees? Are scholarships available? Um, are there any interventions on, on the sort of daily fees uh, topic there? Um, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Teddy, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, right now there's no um, form of support from government, but we have several NGOs working in Makoko. And because of the huge, the sheer population of the children and the uh, poverty level, there's a lot of empowerment. Uh, there are lots of empowerment um, programs. And one of them is a scholarship. Um, there are several NGOs that are involved in a scholarship for the children. Some provide um, school materials, some pay uh, school fees, and uh, our organization, Team Hope, also pay, uh, is involved in the scholarship empowerment for several children in the community. But because you have such a huge number of children, we're not able to help uh, everybody. And so sometimes some of the uh, our adopted schools, we go there and they say up to 100 children are not in school today up to 50 children are not in school today because uh, their parents couldn't give them 15 naira to come. And so it's uh, really a huge problem because most of the NGOs working um, uh, on empowerment in Makoko are underfunded. And so it's, uh, we're not able to go around the problem to be able to pay for every single child. So most of the time it's the parents that pay. And then the, the ones who are able to pay, we just pay like the whole term. And uh, you can imagine a whole term is about 3,000 Naira. 3,000 Naira is about $7. And um, it, may, it may look uh, for people uh, maybe uh, that's in the middle class and all of that are uh, well off. It may look like a, a small money, but it's a lot for families that are, that are of eight children, seven children, five children to be able to pay in bulk for all the children they are of school age. So. Uh, right now, I'm not aware of any form of government support. In fact, the government, especially Lagos State government, is more keen on ensuring that Makoko as a community is demolished and moved away. They are not interested in upgrading this community. They are not interested in um, investing in the lives of the people or reaching out to them in terms of social services. They just want them to move. And what actually brought Makoko into international reckoning was a forced eviction notice uh, a first eviction attempt by the state government in 2000, in July 2012, where the community uh, was given 72 hours to vacate. You have a community of over 100,000, and then you are giving them 72 hours to vacate when there was a pending court judgment, and when they were not able to vacate because how do you how do you move your entire family? How do you get out within 72 hours? So the government came and started demolition houses. Some, some children fell into the water, some were rescued. A local chief was killed by one of the government operatives. So government, the, 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 neither the state or the federal government is interested in any empowerment activity as far as Makoko is concerned, but that's a completely um, is another topic altogether. But the fact is that most of the assistance comes from um, local uh, uh, non-governmental organizations such as ours. Okay, thank you, Betty. So the government is really not going to be effective in, in these no. uh, sort of uh, times. And there's no. sort of an interesting conversation going in the chat box related to that, you know, on the, there are a lot of governments that are offering tax incentives and these things, but that's actually not reaching the informal economy. So as much yes. as the government maybe is trying to, to implement some of these things, Vanessa mentioned, uh, like some countries like Morocco implemented a simplified business registration process to formalize the informal um, you know, uh, businesses. Um, and it, maybe, Faye, I'll come back to you on this. Um, I mean, do you see the, the sort of government interventions really at odds with being effective in informal economies? I mean, do you think um, the government can play a role here? Or do you think, like Betty, it's really going to be up to more to, to community-based organizations um, and NGOs to to sort of alleviate this, this economic risk for for the informal sector, yeah, I, I think um, I think the, the only way, the only arm of government really 
that is best positioned to do anything will be the local government, uh, uh, the local government offices. The reason for that is that you, you see that the federal government and the state government tend to uh, develop policies uh, that, that are on an aggregated level and mostly serve large corporations. Uh, and you can, you can understand the reason why the incentive uh, for the federal and state government is that the, the tax base of large organizations, if you look at it on a single basis, is, is quite significant for them. Uh, thinking of the tax for a woman that makes, uh, I don't know, 50,000 naira a, a month, is not a very exciting proposition to a state governor, for instance. Uh, so the best, the closest arm of government will be the local government. But again, we still need help from uh, other organizations and businesses that are closer to these communities uh, who, who can then partner with the local government to provide the right uh, the right solutions, but the, the, the informal sector has to be treated quite really quite like a separate entity of state that needs to be approached completely differently. Super, thanks, Faye. Gigi, any, any thoughts on that uh, before I, I come to you with the next question that was specifically posed for you? Yeah, I think you know, one of the biggest issues is that generally the informal sector is not considered as a business sector. And, uh, and, and the first thing that we need is governments and, uh, and financial institutions and everything to change their perspective. I mean, that's one of the reasons I highlight, uh, like my presentation, that many of these businesses are actually making really good money, and yet we see them as survivalist and subsistence businesses. And when we see them as survivalist and subsistence, we assume that uh, tomorrow, if they found a formal job, they would leave their business and they would take a formal job, which is absolute rubbish. Uh, and so, so, you know, when, when uh, governments, municipalities, uh, financial institutions and so on recognize this as a legitimate business sector, um, like the gig economy, you know, an Airbnb and an Uber driver is increasingly for a long time wasn't recognized as a business. And now there's a recognition that that gig economy is its own business sector. We need the same with the informal sector, recognition of that, because then we start regulating, we start creating financial products, we start creating bylaws, municipal things, whatever it might be, we start designing them for a part of our, our, our business uh, sector. And, um, and that becomes critical. I think the starting point is let's recognize these as businesses, as a legitimate, long-term established business sector, and then, um, and then we, uh, th then we start planning, building, uh, making laws and so on for the sector. Absolutely, so sort of formalizing that informal economy and recognizing that, I think, to, to sort of Vanessa's point about what they're trying to do in Morocco. Um, and and uh, Gigi, uh, some, Sam had asked a specific question for you. I think it's not just limiting to, to recognizing the informal businesses as an economy, but also recognizing informal workers. So one of the questions was specifically around uh, migrant workers. Um, and I think in, in South Africa, you probably experience this more than, than we do here in Kenya. Um, I mean, really, what do you see as the, the impact for migrant workers and how are those people, um, you know, being affected if they're not even documented, there's no way that they, any sort of stimulus package or relief would reach them. Um, do you have any sort of thoughts on, on, on that? So in South Africa, we have a particularly big problem with that because um, the social grant system, which gives grants to mothers and pensioners, doesn't apply to... Um, to immigrant uh, workers, uh, and so, um, and and we've actually seen to a large extent a fair amount of social unrest caused by um, by these workers who are unable to carry on operating. Uh, my, my so, uh, and it's a problem, and I, and I think the government is seriously remiss as seeing immigrant uh, workers as uh, foreigners, as they're called, and, and not catering for them. Uh, but that's another issue. I, wh one of the things that we're looking at, uh, and I think is an important thing, is about let's get these informal workers back to work. So we are busy in a drive at the moment with some business entities around saying, how do we, uh, like Faye said, these business, um, these business, these uh, workers and these informal businesses need to get back to work because if they can't get a livelihood they're just going to do it illegally out of sight and not follow any um you know kind of hygiene measures so 
So the big thing at the moment is, is they've just released in South Africa the ability for uh, recyclers and, um, and, and the similar uh, sector to open again. I believe that we need to get um, push government to allow certain immigrant sectors uh, where there are um, where, 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 uh, where they're not getting any social uh, grant benefits to, to get back to work. And, and I think across Africa, this has got to be the issue, is that how do we allow people to get back to work? And my belief is you can't keep people in, in uh, we, we, we're applying a Western model in terms of lockdowns. We should be restricting people to the street because the reality is these businesses are residential business. 80% of businesses are street businesses. People operate within a street or within a neighborhood. Let's restrict, um, let's restrict the lockdown to street and then we allow the little hair salon or we allow the little vegetable trader, we allow the, um, the fast food outlet that's in the street to operate within the street and then you can't leave that street because the practicality of stay at home is rubbish. Most places can't do that, number one. And number two, the informal businesses are operating in the street and they do not need people to take uh, public transport. They don't need people to stand in a queue at a formal retailer. And so in essence, we should enable them to, to start work. And, and, and that's, that's what I believe the opportunity is. Let's get people back to work, whether it's on a street basis, limited basis, let's get them back to work. Okay, great. Um, and maybe we just have, uh, we're running out of time, but Betty, I have one last question I wanted to pose for you. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll just try to keep your answer uh, as, as succinct as possible. Um, Urvashi from India was asking a question specifically about the economic impact on women um, and their ability to save and grow. Um, and specifically, she was asking, you know, how have they, do they have enough savings to sort of get through this economic time? Um, Faye, I also see you nodding. If you want to contribute to this after Betty, you're welcome to. Um, Betty, any specific thoughts on, on the impact of women and if they can't work right now due to the, you know, the restrictions, do they have, actually have enough savings to survive? Um, if we knew, you mentioned they don't even have enough, enough money to put their kids through school. Um, do you want to just share your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, women actually bear the biggest brunt of this whole uh, impact of COVID-19 because in many uh, in many communities across uh, Nigeria, um, you see uh, the women with uh, having so many children, and then many of them are actually the breadwinners in their homes. May not apply to every home, but in many of the communities, and then these are people that survive whose families survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So majority of the families we work with are actually uh, in, in a very bad shape in very bad shape uh, economically there are no savings that is just the basic truth there are no savings everything in the last three weeks or one month has gone into feeding no safety net nothing and so from the little businesses that do they are basically reduced to beggars Dep uh, depending on palliatives provided by NGOs and then a few times by government. Most of the time, the government's uh, palliatives don't reach down. And we're wondering, but when government wants the vote of these same people, they are able to locate them in all the corners. But right now, government cannot locate uh, many pe people, especially in very marginalized and remote communities. So, and then you, you, we've had a few cases where people actually protested openly. They said they're not going to stay at home anymore. Uh, they will have to take the risk of being killed by COVID-19 because they need to provide for their families. So it's a very bleak situation. There are no savings. Women are not having it easy at all. The impact is so much because they're actually the caregivers in the home. So they will have to find food for the children at all costs. The children don't bother to know. So it's really, the impact is really huge on our women. Yeah, so a disproportionate negative effect on women, most definitely. Yes. And I think we'll ta we'll tackle this in a in a, a separate webinar. Um, but Faye, I know you you were nodding sort of when I posed the question. Uh, if you want to unmute uh, and share, maybe quick thirty yeah, seconds because uh, we're running uh, running. Yeah, just on. a couple of thoughts. One is, I mean, what Gigi said about uh, restricting to the streets is it's so insightful because it, it, it's almost as if if the government were to choose which sectors to uh, uh, to sort of ease first. It should be the informal sector, 
because the formal sector be, have a basic formula to coming out of economic crisis. They, they start by laying off and cutting costs, which increases the unemployment in that sector. Whereas the informal sector want to produce more goods and services, which tends to drive up employment, which, you know, when aggregated adds value. Uh, to Betty's comment, that it's true there's, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, unnecessary effects on women during this period. Obviously, because they are the care caregivers, the, the kids are also locked at home. They can't go to school. And uh, there are also reports now, uh, increasing reports of women that are undergoing abuse who also can no longer reach for help because the organizations and institutions that will traditionally help them are also on lockdown. Uh, and that's something that the government needs to look at and address uh, very, very quickly. Thanks. Thanks so much, Faye. And, and I realize we're, we're running short on time, but there's now been a very interesting thread uh, on the chat. Uh, and I don't know which of, which of you or if any, I mean, we can, we can uh, if, if anyone wants to respond to this, who's on the call, um, sort of about the, 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 the sectors that are getting involved. Have, has anybody on this call seen, you know, any informal sectors adjust their, their primary services to producing cloth masks, hand sanitizers? Um, I know in Kenya, the, the day that the law came out where you had to wear a face mask, all of a sudden we had all these Kitenge uh, masks, which is the local, local fabric here on the streets already uh, with hawkers on the road. Um, yeah. You know, I think it is an interesting question as to whether any informal sector businesses have, have seen that pivot in terms of their, their actual sector and service that they're providing. Um, yeah, if, they, if yeah. I may jump in on that, if I may just uh, take, take the first uh, stab at that, what we've seen is a lot of uh, the, the, the neighborhood tailors in the streets who traditionally make their income off sewing clothes for, for people going for, you know, in Africa, we go for parties for every reason. Uh, and, and now they are the ones uh, uh, making, making cloth masks and, and, and you know, ask, you know put it, putting it on WhatsApp groups and saying it's this amount, you can, come and, you can come and buy this and all of that. And most of them are making the cloth mask from leftover uh, fabric, which, which they have from previous tailoring, uh, tailoring uh, assignments. So it's quite, it's quite a fascinating uh, in, uh, innovation in that, in that particular informal, uh, informal sector. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've seen the same yeah. in South Africa um, with, uh, with uh, people who are doing sewing stuff, uh, um, making masks, and to the question, uh, we bought some in my home, some from a lady who was selling picnic blankets and other things to affluent people in the neighborhood, now making these masks. And they're probably a higher quality and better made than uh, with more layers than any of the ones that uh, you would generally find available. So, and, and I think this is the issue, you know, the informal sector is not about low quality. It's just informal, you know, it's not about cheap. It's just about informal again, you know, so... Um, we often have we make these mistakes of seeing informal as, as low quality, low cost, uh, unsophisticated. No, they're just informal supplying different services at a different level. And um, we certainly saw this with some of the protective equipment. And the same with the, what I call the spazarettes, um, seeing them very quickly pivot to offering sanitizers to um, arranging marks on the floor so that people could uh, stand far apart when they were um, coming up to the till and so on. This happens much quicker than the supermarkets. The Spazaret was implementing sanitizer and stuff incredibly quickly. And, and primarily because they were Somali owned to a large extent and they knew that they were going to be closed. Any excuse the police could have, they would close them down. So they made sure that they were squeaky clean very quickly. Yeah. So it goes back to that point of, of around adaptability, particularly um, in during this time. So I think I, I realize that we're about five or six minutes over. So, uh, Margaret, if you want to move to the next slide, Nancy, I'll hand it over to you um, to wrap everything up for us. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. Bye, Betty, Gigi. It's been a, a really robust uh, conversation, I think. And we could go on for at least another three hours, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that time. 
but thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and to all the participants who've, um, who've been very active in the chat, um, we'd like to, to hear from you in terms of if you'd like this, uh, this series to be a little bit longer, uh, maybe one and a half hours every, every Thursday. Um, and we'd also like to hear from all of you about the topics that you'd like to discuss and the speakers that you'd like to hear from. So uh, please feel free to let us know uh, what's on your mind and what you'd like us to cover next. So we've come to the close of yet another session and uh, we um, were uh, excited to see that so many people are interested in these conversations. Um, I just wanted to highlight that we have, we'll be sending out some material to all the participants and the speakers, just giving you some updates on the other kind of platforms you could connect on. Uh, we have WhatsApp and Slack in, in all three countries, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And uh, in front of you, you'll see uh, contact information if you need to speak to, to get in touch with any of us, if you have questions on your mind, or like I said, if you have specific speakers you'd like to hear from and talk topics you'd like to discuss, we wanna know what you'd, you have on your mind and what you'd like to hear. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you and have a wonderful day and please keep safe. Thank you.